On April 8, 2020, for the second time in less than four years, Senator Bernie Sanders suspended his presidential campaign. I wish I could give you better news, but I think you know the truth. And that is that we are now some 300 delegates behind Vice President Biden, and the path toward victory is virtually impossible. And so today, I am announcing the suspension of my campaign. So how did we get here? Well, let's take a look back at the presidential campaign of Bernie Sanders. All the way back in April 2015, Senator Bernie Sanders announced his run for the presidency. I am proud to announce my candidacy for President of the United States of America. Bernie's progressive platform included free education, addressing global warming, putting an end to fracking, taxing the wealthy and corporations, and of course, Medicare for all. But despite large crowds at rallies and massive grassroots support, Sanders faced an uphill battle from his chief rival, former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. Over 400 superdelegates had pledged their support for Clinton even before Sanders had entered the race. But at the same time, Sanders, a registered independent, was gaming the system by running as a Democrat so that he could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Clinton in the Democratic debates and more easily get his name on state ballots. And it turns out that the Democratic National Committee was secretly trying to undermine the Sanders campaign and had a bias towards Clinton. This was publicly revealed in a now infamous email leak in July 2016. The DNC uh, was not running a fair operation, uh, that they were supporting Secretary Clinton. So what I suggested to be true six months ago turns out, in fact, to be true. I'm not shocked, but I am disappointed. And by this point, Bernie had already endorsed Hillary Clinton and couldn't do a damn thing about it. And this angered Bernie supporters, who felt that Hillary and the DNC stole the nomination. In turn, many of them didn't turn out for the general election. Not only that, but in a survey of 50,000 people conducted by the Cooperative Congressional Election Study at Harvard University, 12% of people that voted for Bernie Sanders in the primaries voted for Donald Trump in the general election. So Sanders split the Democratic Party and helped get Donald Trump elected. Thank you for your service, Senator. Cut to February 2019, when Bernie Sanders made an important announcement. Hi, I'm Bernie Sanders. Hi, Bernie. I'm running for president. Well, it's Groundhog Day, again. Our campaign is about transforming our country and creating a government based on the principles of economic, social, racial, and environmental justice. Except that most people care about keeping their jobs and low taxes. Our campaign is about redoubling our efforts to end racism, sexism, homophobia, religious bigotry, and all forms of discrimination. But you can't promise to end those things. What's his plan? To establish the Department of Social Justice? Also, when it comes to the most important issues that Democrats care about, racism and sexism rank very low. The most important issue? Beating President Trump in November. We are running against a president who is a pathological liar, a fraud, a racist, a sexist, a xenophobe, and someone who is undermining American democracy as he leads us in an authoritarian direction. Damn, I just need one more for Orange Man Bad Bingo. Our campaign is not only about defeating Donald Trump, the most dangerous president in modern American history. Bingo, bingo, I got bingo, bingo. Now, if you're a Democrat, you don't need to be reminded how much you hate Trump. But Bernie made sure to repeat this sentiment every single chance he had. We must and will defeat Trump, the most dangerous president in the history of this country. Together, we are going to defeat the most dangerous president in the modern history of this country. The most dangerous president in the modern history of this country. The most dangerous president in the history of our country. Together, we are going to defeat Donald Trump, the most dangerous president in the modern history of our country. And that's all well and good, but first, Bernie needed to defeat his fellow Democratic candidates. And in total, there were a staggering 28 of them. 
And unlike 2016, where he was a progressive insurgent fighting against an establishment corporate Democrat, in 2020, there were several candidates all trying to steal Bernie's progressive thunder, including Julian Castro. Just because a woman, or let's also not forget someone in the trans community, a trans female, uh, is poor, doesn't mean they shouldn't have the right to exercise that right to choose. Beto O'Rourke. Necesitamos incluir cada persona en el éxito de esta economía. Cada, votar, ca cada votante necesitamos. And Senator Elizabeth Warren, who co-opted the majority of Bernie's platform. Both Sanders and Warren campaigned on wealth inequality, Wall Street reform, a Green New Deal, campaign finance reform, free public college tuition, the elimination of existing student debt, and Medicare for All plans that would eliminate all private insurance. But with Warren parroting most of Bernie's agenda, this saturated Sanders' message during the first few debates and made him less unique. After the first debate in June, Warren's real clear politics polling average was neck and neck with Sanders. Warren gained traction as the debates went on, and by September, she had pulled ahead of Sanders, leaving him in third place. Cut to October 4th, when it was revealed that Bernie Sanders had suffered a heart attack during a campaign event in Las Vegas. And while many people thought that this marked the end of his campaign, it turned out it was only the beginning. Two weeks after his heart attack, Bernie Sanders participated in the fourth Democratic presidential debate. You're 78 years old and you just had a heart attack. How do you reassure Democratic voters that you're up to the stress of the presidency? Well, uh, let me invite you all to a major rally we're having in Queens, New York, BernieSanders.com. We're going to have a special guest. And that special guest wasn't his cardiologist. It was Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. The only reason that I had any hope in launching a long shot campaign for Congress is because Bernie Sanders proved that you can run a grassroots campaign and win in an America where we almost thought it was impossible. Except that Bernie didn't win, so kind of a dumb example. But Ocasio-Cortez wasn't the only politician to come out in support of Bernie Sanders. Fellow Justice Democrats like Ilhan Omar, Rashida Tlaib, Pramila Jayapal, and Ro Khanna also endorsed the Democratic Socialist. Then you had Dr. Cornel West, Nina Turner, Michael Moore, Naomi Klein, Sean King, and Killer Mike. And I remember Baldwin saying, you asked my father to wait, my brother to wait, my uncle to wait, how long must I wait on rights and equality and liberty? And as a black child, that resonated with me because I knew I'd been denied. Nothing like a multimillionaire rapper with a Netflix show preaching about inequality and claiming that he's been denied. But the fact is that these endorsements didn't do anything to attract voters beyond Bernie's anti-establishment base. Then there's Bernie's celebrity endorsements. Can't wait to see Bernie debate Mr. Trump. Cause you know I love nails, you know what I'm saying? I mean, do you think that Dick Van Dyke, Cardi B, the guy that plays the Hulk, or Danny DeVito are going to sway anyone with their political opinion? I feel If Frank from It's Always Sunny can't convince grandma and grandpa to vote for Bernie, then I don't know who can. My point is that celebrity endorsements do not make any difference. Otherwise, Hillary Clinton would be the president. I want my daughter to grow up seeing a woman lead our country. But don't worry, Beyonce, there'll be a woman president soon enough. By December 2019, Elizabeth Warren had plummeted in the polls. This left Bernie in a solid second place, but still 10 points behind Joe Biden. On January 20th, Sanders surrogate Zephyr Teachout wrote an op-ed in The Guardian stating that Joe Biden has a big corruption problem. Middle class Joe has perfected the art of taking big contributions then representing his corporate donors at the cost of middle and working class Americans. Teach Out didn't say anything wrong per se, because people have been talking about Biden's relationship with credit card issuers like MBNA for over 20 years. But instead of calling Joe out, Sanders disavowed what Teach Out said. Joe and I have strong disagreements on a number of issues and we'll 
argue those disagreements out. Uh, but it is absolutely not my view that Joe is, is corrupt in any way. Uh, and I'm sorry that that uh, op-ed appeared to me. But this contradicts what he said about Biden back in the December debate. Now, there's a real competition going on up here. My good friend Joe, and he is a good friend, <laughs> he's received contributions from 44 billionaires. So in December, Sanders implied that taking contributions from billionaires is corruption. But in January, said with absolute certainty that Joe Biden is not corrupt. But then in February, he called out Mayor Pete and Joe again for taking money from billionaires. I will tell you, Pete, what the American people want and Joe what the American people want. They don't want candidates to be running to billionaires for huge amounts of funding. Right, let's let's Pete, clear this up once and for Pete all. Pete has this, gotten uh, funding you, got people from over 50 billionaires. Um, this, this Joe, needs I to think, has gotten up. a little bit more. So they are either corrupt or they aren't. Make up your damn mind, Bernie. But Sanders himself isn't the squeaky clean champion of the working class as you might think. Take, for example, Our Revolution, a political action organization that Sanders launched in 2016. CNN's Jake Tapper questioned Sanders about it on State of the Nation. I want to ask you, a nonprofit organization that you launched, Our Revolution, has been promoting you. Uh, it is under the tax code. It can accept unlimited money. It's not required to disclose its top donors. My response to, to that is I don't want, I, I, I do not believe that any group, our revolution or anybody else, should be raising money from wealthy people. And I'm not asking for their help. They legally can do what they want to do because you have a corrupt political system. Don't hate the player, hate the game. So we are independent of our revolution, all these other groups. They are legally able to do what they want. But that's not true, as our revolution's former president, Nina Turner, is now a national co-chair on Bernie's campaign. So not quite as independent as Bernie claims. If you wanted to stop it, he could stop it. So my message to all of the candidates, let's end all of that stuff right now. You want to do it today? Let's do it today. So his excuse is, we'll keep doing it because everyone else does it. And that means that Bernie is a gigantic hypocrite. Who knew? On January 13th, sources close to Senator Elizabeth Warren leaked to CNN that back in 2018, during a private conversation at dinner, Bernie Sanders allegedly told Warren that he did not believe a woman could win in 2020. And Warren released a statement doubling down in his claim. Bernie and I met for more than two hours in December 2018 to discuss the 2020 election. Among the topics that came up was what would happen if the Democrats nominated a female candidate. I thought a woman could win. He disagreed. Let's not turn to an issue that's come up in the last 48 hours. Senator Sanders, CNN reported yesterday that, and Senator Sanders, Senator Warren confirmed in a statement that in 2018, you told her that you did not believe that a woman could win the election. Why did you say that? Well, as a matter of fact, I didn't say it. Uh, and I don't want to waste a whole lot of time on this because this is what Donald Trump and maybe some of the media want. Wait, he's denying that he said it? I thought that Warren had confirmed that he did say it. Uh, anybody knows me knows that it's incomprehensible that I would think that a woman could not be president of the United States. Hillary Clinton won the popular vote by three million votes. How could anybody in a million years not believe that a woman could become president of the United States? So Hillary Clinton losing the Electoral College is proof that a woman can win the presidency. Got it. Senator Sanders, I do want to be clear here. You're saying that you never told Senator Warren that a woman could not win the election. That is correct. Senator Warren, what did you think when Senator Sand Sanders told you a woman could not win the election? <laughs> I disagreed. Bernie is my friend, and I am not here to try to fight with Bernie. But look, this question about whether or not a woman can be president has been raised. Yeah, you were the one that raised it, Grandma. So this whole attack by Warren was a major miscalculation. In her attempt to paint Bernie Sanders as a sexist, something that even the casual observer would know to be completely out of character, it only emboldened his supporters and created new ones. According to his campaign, Sanders raised roughly $4 million from 200,000 people within two days after the debate. And 25,000 of those people were brand new donors. Not only that, but within two weeks, 
Bernie's real clear politics polling average jumped from 19.2% to 23%, higher than it had been in the previous 10 months. This gave Bernie the momentum he needed heading into the Iowa caucuses, where he won the popular vote, coming in second in delegates behind Pete Buttigieg. In comparison, Joe Biden came in fourth behind Elizabeth Warren. Biden's weak fourth place finish and his immediate dip into polls was troubling for the Democratic establishment. And that's when people started to make a big deal about Bernie not being a Democrat. Let me just ask, is anyone else on the stage concerned about having a Democratic Socialist at the top of the Democratic ticket? First off, every candidate on that stage should be raising their hand as they are moderate to far left Democrats, while Bernie Sanders is a radical Democratic Socialist. Not to mention that Sanders is their competition. So if you wanna score points with moderate voters, this is the perfect opportunity to try and get in a few punches. Let me just ask, is anyone else on the stage concerned about having a Democratic Socialist at the top of the Democratic ticket? I'm not. <laughs> Senator Klobuchar? <laughs> Great job, morons. Well, except for Klobuchar, who also brought up a very important point. I keep listening to this same debate, and it is not real. It is not real, Bernie, because two-thirds of the Democrats in the Senate are not on your bill, and because it would kick 149 million Americans off their current health insurance in four years. And Klobuchar is right. It would be very unlikely that any of Bernie Sanders' policies would make it through Congress. That means he would be the most ineffective president in the modern history of the United States. And if you think that Congress is going to pass any part of Bernie's agenda with the current makeup of the House and the Senate, you're f***ing dreaming. So after winning New Hampshire, Bernie Sanders became the clear frontrunner. We are going to unite together and defeat the most dangerous president in the modern history of this country. Joe Biden had placed fifth in New Hampshire and had already left the state before the election to concentrate on his firewall, South Carolina. It was around this time when pundits and debate moderators finally started questioning Bernie about socialism and his past statements praising communist dictatorships. You've praised the Chinese Communist Party for lifting more people out of extreme poverty than any other country. You also have a track record of expressing sympathy for socialist governments in Cuba and in Nicaragua. Can Americans trust that a democratic socialist president will not give authoritarians a free pass? I have opposed authoritarianism all over the world. But that's not quite what he said back in 1985. You may recall way back in, when was it, 1961, they invaded Cuba. And everybody was totally convinced that Castro was the worst guy in the world, that all the Cuban people were going to rise up in rebellion against Fidel Castro. They had forgot that he educated their kids, gave them health care, totally transformed the society. You know, not to say that uh, Fidel Castro or Cuba are perfect, they are certainly not. When asked about this on 60 Minutes, he doubled down. You got, it's unfair to simply say everything is bad. You know, when Fidel Castro came into office, you know what he did? He had a massive literacy program. Is that a bad thing? And that's a big issue. Praising Fidel Castro doesn't play well in Florida, which has a population of over a million and a half Cuban Americans. Cuba made progress on education. Yes, I think, really? <clears throat> really? And for some reason, the only candidate to attack Bernie directly over his views on socialism was former New York City Mayor Mike Bloomberg. So what a wonderful country we have. The best known socialist in the country happens to be a millionaire with three houses. What I miss here? Well, you'll miss that I work in Washington, house one. That's the first problem. Live in Burlington, house two. That's good. And like thousands of other Vermonters, I do have a summer well, camp. Forgive me for that. But, Where is your home? But, which tax? Which tax haven New do you York, have your home? New York City, thank you very much. Yeah, well, and I pay yeah, oh, all I'm my home. taxes. I'm just... And I'm happy to do it because I get something for it. Ooh, Bernie is so rattled that he called his summer home a summer camp. This election cycle would have been very different had Bloomberg entered earlier, as he was the only one who had the balls to go up against Bernie in this way. We're not going to throw out capitalism. We tried that. Other countries tried that. It was called communism, and it just didn't work. Whoa, so whoa, whoa. Watch what you say about communism, Mr. Bloomberg. <laughs> we have now won the Nevada caucus. After Bernie won Nevada, many pundits started writing Joe Biden off. But there was a problem with doing that. 
And if you want to beat Trump, what you're going to need is an unprecedented grassroots movement of black and white and Latino, Native American and Asian. And that's definitely helpful, but he was ignoring the fact that in poll after poll, African Americans prefer Joe Biden over Sanders. In fact, pretty much everyone over the age of 30 was leaning towards Biden. And on February 29th, that was proven in a big way when Joe Biden won the South Carolina primary with nearly 49% of the vote. Just days ago, the press and the pundits had declared this candidacy dead. Now, thanks to all of you, the heart of the Democratic Party, we just won and we've won big because of you. And on Super Tuesday, Biden won 11 out of 15 states. A week later, Biden won another five out of six and Bernie's path to denomination narrowed significantly. But Bernie had one more shot, and that was the 11th debate. Steyer, Buttigieg, Klobuchar, Bloomberg, and Warren all suspended their campaigns. So after nine months of debates, with no less than six candidates on the stage at the same time, all Bernie needed to do was focus on getting his message out and show why he is the best Democrat for the job. I think it's imperative that we defeat Trump. He is the most dangerous president in the modern history of this country. Ugh, never mind. Now, let's take a moment to consider that Joe Biden is 77 years old and Bernie Sanders is 78. Normally, when a candidate announces their pick for vice president, it's not that important. But in this day and age, well, let's just say that whoever is chosen needs to be ready to become the president on day one. But there's a catch. Democrats are demanding that whoever it is, she has to be a woman. I commit that I will in fact appoint a, I'll pick a woman to be vice president. There are a number of women who are qualified to be president tomorrow. I would pick a woman to be my vice president. So Biden is 100% committing to this premise. But what about Bernie? The vice president committed to picking a woman as his running mate. If you get the nomination, will you? Uh, in all likelihood, I, I will. Uh, for me, it's not just uh, nominating uh, or uh, a woman. It is making sure that we have a progressive women and there are progressive women out there. So my very strong tendency is to move in that direction. Saying that you have a strong tendency or in all likelihood isn't good enough. You'd think that Bernie would be smarter on the subject. But then again, this is a man that can't shut up about Cuba's literacy program. So I'm probably giving him too much credit. The rest of the debate was Sanders and Biden second-guessing President Trump's response to the coronavirus, so we don't have to go over it. But I do want to remind you what Senator Sanders said about the subject in early March during a Fox News town hall. If you had to, would you close down the borders? No. I mean, what you don't want to do right now, we have a president who has uh, propagated uh, xenophobic uh, anti-immigrant sentiment from before he was elected. And isn't it interesting that a president who has been demagoguing and demonizing immigrants, the first thing that he could think about is closing down uh, the, the border. So if Bernie had won the presidency in 2016, he would not have closed the borders and we might have millions of coronavirus cases. And that's great because I, for one, would rather die of coronavirus than be called a racist. So on April 8th, Alone in one of his three houses, Bernie Sanders finally called it quits. We are now some 300 delegates behind Vice President Biden, and the path toward victory is virtually impossible. So while we are winning the ideological battle, and while we are winning the support of so many young people and working people throughout the country, I have concluded that this battle for the Democratic nomination will not be successful. If you were winning the ideological battle, you'd be winning the nomination. On a practical note, let me also say this. I will stay on the ballot in all remaining states and continue to gather delegates. While Vice President Biden will be the nominee, we must continue working to assemble as many delegates as possible at the Democratic Convention, where we will be able to exert significant influence over the party platform and other functions. So the plan was for Bernie Sanders to hold his delegates hostage all the way to the convention and encouraged his supporters to keep voting for him in upcoming primaries. But five days later, on April 13th, 
a day that shall live in infamy. So today I am asking all Americans, I'm asking every Democrat, I'm asking every Independent, I'm asking a lot of Republicans to come together in this campaign to support your candidacy, oh. which I endorse. And just like that, Bernie caved. Way to go, you chump. I have been very pleased that your staff and my staff have been working together over the last several weeks uh, to coming up with a number of task forces. Uh, these are uh, task forces that will look at some of the most important issues facing this country. What are the task forces all about? <laughs> it doesn't matter. Because if by some miracle Biden becomes president, he'll likely forget that this conversation about task forces ever took place. The truth is that Biden isn't going to get a chance to implement any of Bernie's demands because Biden is unlikely to be elected president. Because for the second election cycle in a row, Bernie successfully split the party and Bernie supporters aren't going to be easily swayed to switch their vote, especially not to Joe Biden. Because while Bernie sold out to the Democratic establishment again, his hardcore supporters have a lot more integrity. And that's it for now. Thank you so much for watching and subscribing, and I hope to see you all next time.